morning, everybody. Are we all online? We are. Thank you. Morning. Good morning, morning. everybody. So, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, um, the HR Professional's Guide to Digital Change. Uh, I'm Joss Kreese. I'm the Principal Analyst for the EduServe Ex Ex Executive Briefing Programme, and we're sponsoring um, and running this webinar this morning. But I am supported by a range of industry experts. You can see the names on the screen. Sonia Halliwell, Assistant Director, HR and OD from Wigan. Uh, Kushal uh, Birla, Head of Custom Service from Warwickshire County Council. Caroline Nugent, um, PPMA President and HR Director at OneSource, that's Newman Havering, and Neil Crump, Head of Digital Transformation Customer Services from Worcestershire County Council. I know there are also quite a few experts uh, on the line and people who are primed to ask a few difficult questions of, of the panelists. So um, uh, without more ado, I, I suggest we go, uh, we move on. Um, so the next slide gives you the pictures of everybody, so you know who we all are, as we're not doing a, a video uh, for for this. Um, and what we're going to be looking at initially, before we open this up for general questions, is a deeper dive into the challenges and opportunities for HR professionals in digital change programs. So just by way of a brief uh, introduction uh, from me. So everybody's talking about digital change. Every local authority in the UK will have some form or other of digital program. Uh, and we all sort of know that this is much more about people and culture than it is about process and technology. So we've worked with a PPMA to explore if this is actually true in practice and what are the view of HR professionals what might need to change. Because in practice, what seems to happen is that many of the so-called digital programs gravitate back to technology-enabled change programs with relatively little consideration of some of the human aspects and, according to our survey, um, not enough involvement from HR and OD professionals. So working with the PPMA and HR and OD professionals, we've looked at how we can ensure that the HR components are central to any digitally driven change program. Um, looking at the skills gap and then giving some practical guidance on what needs to change. And I think it's fair to say that um, most professional areas are still somewhat behind the curve in terms of the potential from the technology and what the implications are for job design, process re-engineering and changing the governance of uh, local authorities. And those are the issues that we're going to be exploring uh, today with the panel. So the, the process for this morning is that each of our panelists are going to give a short uh, introduction to a topic. Um, they're going to talk about the experience that they've personally had, as well as the work that we've undertaken with EduServe uh, through surveys, roundtables, um, and a whole range of individual uh, interviews. So without more ado, if I can introduce Caroline Nugent, the PPMA President and HR Director at OneSource, uh, to give us a short introduction to the topic. Caroline, are you, uh, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Joss. I'm, I shall hand over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to, to start off by saying that we thought this was really important at PPMA to, to contribute to this um, survey, because I think you're right, Joss, there's been a lot in the past that, that digital has been IT and there's not been so much HR and OD. So we thought it was really important to look at some of those skills um, uh, in, in that role as well. So my part, I'm, I'm going to look at some of the uh, leadership issues um, as part of that. Can I just have... Um, slide access to the slide lovely thank you um, so the role of HR so this for me is around looking at leadership and where we actually go in in future um, the good old days of personnel those of us that have been around a long time will know we used to be personnel and we were very much um, recruitment and, and real day-to-day -day stuff the role in HR now is much more strategic and that's where um, I was saying in the slide there about working outside parameters. You can't be in HR now and focus just on people. You've really got to look at being one of the change agents, one of the people that pushes some of the the um, the issues in internally. And is that that friend, that that challenging friend to the, the leadership team um, of, of what they need to think about. 
Um, so it definitely is not that old school personnel. HR has got to be much more strategic and leading some of these. I think in the past, um, I specifically said skills high up the agenda because the last few years, HR has been very much focused on reductions and restructures. We're now in the thing we've got to look at skills and we've got to look at what the basic skills are for the public servants of today. So this sort of timing wise is really critical um, for us going forward in, in part of the, um, the roles now that, that HR's got. Um, can I change the slide again? So it's lovely. Um, so five years time, um, I'm, I'm just thinking how much has changed in the last five years and how different it's likely to be. Digitally savvy, we still have staff um, that cannot do basic basic word, basic cell. And one of the things that, that sort of took it for me is we're taking on young people now that we expect to be digitally savvy and they're coming through the schooling and actually they may have word experience, i.e. typing in instead of handwriting, but they're not actually digitally savvy. They can't use word. They can't use the things we are taking for granted. So I think we need to completely rethink how we are from bottom to top of people being savvy. Um, we've got to be the innovators in this as, as leaders um, in HR. Again, I think, uh, as I said previously, uh, uh, HR have been on the, the back foot of some of these. We, we have people that are um, in HR as the leader, perhaps further down the organisations now and haven't got that voice. So it's really important we are there showing ourselves and, um, at, at uh, SLTs and, and corporate management teams so they know we have ideas as well. And sometimes because we're not IT, we might think of different things. Um, True business partners comes down to the fact that, again, that there's still a number of uh, HR departments, we're operational. We're not giving that real high level strategic input. Um, in, and in five years time, we absolutely need to be that. We can't be the police officers anymore. We have got to be business partners and looking at what's fundamental in each of those departments that we're um, supporting. And as part of that, awareness outside of function, if you don't know what's coming up, what big ticket items are coming up, you can't support them. Therefore, you can't look at what digital skills we're going to need for five years time. If we don't know what's happening next year, how on earth are we going to be thinking for, for five years? time. And my last slide, um, politicians and board leader, um, digital structure. I've, I've said about future leadership because I actually think the future is now. I think we've really got to get particularly politicians that perhaps have um, been in local government for, for many, many years thinking differently about how they're going to actually save money and how they're going to use some of the digital strategies to really look at the significant cost savings that we're all um, coming up against at the, at the moment. So I think, again, we're, we're talking about the future, but we've really got to grasp this now. Otherwise, we will have a whole range of people that are just not able to do basics, whether they're staff or whether they're members of the public. Absolutely got to model the behaviour. So, you know, if they're sitting in meetings, still bringing along huge, big piles of paper when they're sitting there with an iPad as well, staff will see that and staff will say, well, if it doesn't matter for the, the top tier, um, we don't have to learn. So absolutely, they, they need to model the behaviours. Um, improving the services to the public and the cost saving productivity are all interrelated because we've all got to make the cuts. We've got to have different ways of doing it. And, and digital is the way forward for absolutely bringing in a number of the changes that we need. You know, we're seeing lots and lots of stuff on the market and we'll hear about some of that this morning. But there is an absolute fundamental you know, change needed to bring lots of these things in and improve services as a consequence. Thank you, Caroline. I mean, a re really interesting introduction, I think, to the topic. In our survey, by the way, um, we found only 3% of councils reporting digital literacy of frontline staff as being good. 3%. And yet less than half have actually got any sort of plan to do anything about it, which I think, you know, supports your view, Caroline, about just how big a challenge we have and why it is a challenge for today, not for the future. So, um, Neil, if you're there, um, can I hand over to you for uh, the next bit about how, how we're actually keeping pace with this um, with this change? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Joss. So, I really wanted to get involved, a bit like Caroline, really, uh, because I totally see how important culture is to our organisation and to enabling digital. 
So with the right skill, right skilled workforce, technology can absolutely be a key enabler of the positive change, both for the organisations and it, most importantly for our customers. So while stating that, I, I need to be clear that it will only really deliver lasting transformation if it's deployed within a culture that embraces and thrives with it. So I'll put there on the slide four different items, four things that we need in our culture. First of which is uh, that sort of behavior of lifelong learning. So the, the rate of technological change and the impacts that has on how work is done means that we've now got a different expectation and a readiness that we need to continuously learn new things. And that needs to be embedded as an attitude uh, in our teams. So our staff have to be uh, not only comfortable, but also invigorated with the prospect of learning new things throughout their working lives. And that goes on top of their sort of professional sort of uh, working lives. So digital therefore becomes part of that. And they should have easy access therefore to sort of a range of materials and support to help them achieve this. In terms of that sort of environment of collaboration, we need to ensure that we've got that collaborative and sharing organisational mindset so that that will help with the fast dissemination of information uh, and in fact knowledge and expertise throughout our workplaces. So that's going to enable us to provide a faster response to um, and actually better connections with our, our customers and our partners. So an example of that has been the work that we've done in Worcestershire around digital inclusion. So working with digital champions in the community who they've then acted as volunteers um, to, to work and to, to upskill people in the community in a digital way and then sort of embed that culture so that they can then access our, our services that have been put online. Um, and there are plenty of other examples of technology that sort of helps promote that collaboration, whether it be Yammer, Facebook, Twitter and the like. The third point was really around having an agile approach to delivery. So when we're actually increasing our rate of change, it also means that we need to uh, look at the way that we deliver. So we need to be more agile. So and what I mean by that is that we need to be more cross functional. Uh, we need to be more cross organizational uh, and make sure that we're not departmental focused. So we, we've got to plan it and do it and review it and then plan again and shorten the cycle between each review. So that means being process light uh, and open to change. So, for example, we, we use a, a low code digital platform uh, and what we've realized is that we have to make sure that people uh, are bought into those working practices so that we can deliver di digital solutions at pace. And those people actually, are the, the people that work in our organization and also our customers, because our customers are helping to co-design those digital solutions. So we've embedded them in that sort of agile approach to delivery. And the final point on culture was that focus on the customer. So it was making sure that uh, the focus on the customer is really about how we focus our efforts on design. So, and we need to make sure that we allow our team space to learn from the customer experiences and use this input to innovate how best to deliver the customer needs. So how are we actually going to practically achieve this? Well, the advancement of these new technologies and the favorable organizational culture depends very much on sort of strong forward looking leadership from senior managers and other influencers. So it requires us as internal leaders, as well as the promotion of shared initiatives across partner organizations and then customers. Yeah. So there are some really good examples actually out there at the moment. Uh, I, I could point to Ellsbury Vale, for example, uh, with their use of Alexa for customer services and how they're looking to lead from the front or Enfield, for example, about how they're looking to use artificial intelligence and in the chatbot. And that, that will actually change the culture at the same time. Yeah. Um, and the, the final point really is around the shared initiatives. 
So we, we need to be identifying, firstly, existing shared initiatives that require more visible support from senior leadership. Yeah, so an example where we've got in Worcestershire is saying, actually, we had this digital strategy a few years ago. Now, how can we actually get more visible leadership across all of the public sector in Worcestershire and have a one Worcestershire banner and, and therefore change the HR and culture uh, across uh, organisations rather than solely within the county council itself? And it also means about looking to get new shared initiatives off the ground. And uh, one thing we're doing is have, as an example, is around Worcestershire Office of Data Analytics, where actually we're saying across all of the public sector, how can we start sharing data better? And again, that's going to require different culture to the way that we've done things previously. So that gives my sort of input and starting point for the questions later. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Neil, that's a, that's a really good introduction. Um, it's interesting, you know, you talk a lot about the culture and the need for developing digital skills. I'm going to give you another little stat from the work that we undertook. 29% um, of HR professionals, only 29%, are actually promoting digital skills either in recruitment or indeed in performance measures in their organization, which says to me, that over 70% just aren't doing anything about it. And it seems to me as though there is a real need for um, HR to raise its game uh, in this, to be more central uh, and to justify being more central to the way in which councils are changing their service design, their culture, their practices and so on. So what I'd like to do now is to bring in a Kushal, uh, if I may. Um, Kushal, um, just changing the way councils are delivering services, you know, allowing the sort of new partnerships, the self-service, the, the, the ensuring that we, we, we don't have um, avoidable contacts implies that we need to change skills, practices, policies, and there's a real role, it seems to me, for HR professionals in particular to be taking more of a control uh, on this, rethinking what they do, what we do as HR professionals, and how we go about it. What's your, what's your take on this? Right. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for um, asking me to participate in the webinar. Um, it's interesting, actually, quite a few things I was going to say, this is inevitable, um, have been mentioned, uh, you know, by Caroline and by Neil. So, um, you know, uh, for me, um, you know, I think actually, uh, you know, um, and I'm going to echo what others have said, um, I think technology um, has a potential to transform how we can deliver public services. Um, I think, um, you know, in spite of the challenges of austerity, uh, the fact that local authorities are being asked to manage um, demands and uh, expectations in terms of the public, I think uh, you know we still have a duty, um, you know, to deliver the uh, you know the, the best customer experience for our public and ensure that we are enriching uh, the customer uh, experience. And this is why I think um, you know um, you know technology can help us do that. Um, in Warwickshire, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, what uh, we are calling uh, our Digital First Programme. And um, what we have found, uh, you know, so, you know, we're doing, um, you know, most things that most authorities are doing. So, you know, we have good, you know, good CRM system, you know, we are, we've got information on the web, um, you know, we, we, we do web chat. Um, but actually, you know, um, you know, Neil um, was talking about, um, you know, uh, some of the other authorities that are beginning to delve, um, you know, in, into the world of, um, you know, bots and um, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, what that is highlighting is that actually, um, you know, uh, there is um, uh, some work to be done around, um, you know, um, the skills and competencies uh, that we are requiring um, of our workforce. Um, and, uh, um, and, and there is a deficit um, because traditionally, um, you know, um, our, some of our staff um, have not been exposed to technology. Um, some don't have the confidence to use the technology. And um, we have sometimes with our policies and procedures probably tied the, you know, the staff down to scripts um, and, uh, you know, structures in terms of how they're responding. Um, you know, um, you know, to to the public, be it on the phone or um, you know, face to face. 
And I think actually, uh, you know, we do need to um, uh, challenge, uh, you know, um, you know, and you know, quite a few of these skills policies and procedures that also, uh, you know, would um, I think um, uh, have an impact on how we are also recruiting our staff. Uh, you know, there, you know, we're still, you know, very traditional um, uh, in some parts. Uh, you know, um, you know, um, of public sector in how, uh, you know, um, we find our, you know, our good staff. And, you know, we are talking about the younger workforce. And actually, uh, you know, in this area, I don't think it is um, uh, anything to do with age. It is more to do with embracing the technology um, and using it, um, you know, uh, as I said, to enhance that experience for the customer. Um, so, you know, if staff don't have that confidence to use technology that is conveyed to the public, you know, they will feel that. And um, and also what we want our staff to do is um, to help the public to help themselves um, uh, so that we can actually begin to build, um, you know, some capacity in the communities. Uh, so, you know, Neil talked about the whole assisted digital agenda. That is quite key, but again, uh, we need the right skills to um, ensure that actually we pass on those skills, um, you know, you know, to community agents, to our community catalysts that are going to help us, um, you know, deliver uh, services by using uh, technology, um, you know, not as an ICT infrastructure thing, but more as actually part of, um, you know, um, the customer experience. Um, the other thing, actually, I think it's worth saying is that, um, you know, we talk about public sector, we talk about, um, you know, skills, but what if we can get this right, actually, we are also, um, you know, helping, um, you know, with the, the whole um, transferring the quality of life skills, um, you know, uh, to our public. Uh, because if you look at how um, you know uh, you know we deal with other transactions um, you know um, you know in our daily lives, be it banking, be it applying for jobs, um, you know some of the ways um, the legislation is changing, be it for universal credit, there will be no option but to actually uh, you know uh, you know uh, use um, you know online um, you know applications, or, uh, you know online uh, technology to be able to um, you know um, get what you want. And uh, if you're applying for a job, you know, need to do that, um, you know, online. You know, if you're doing an assessment, you need to do that online. So I think, uh, you know, with what we are trying to do in the public sector, I think we also, um, you know, help, um, you know, a wider agenda in terms of, uh, you know, um, actually ensuring that um, the public out there are skilled to undertake other aspects of their working lives. Um, and um, I think also the other a factor that's worth mentioning is the reason sometimes there's a reticence maybe um, in, in some public uh, uh, you know, organizations um, sort of embracing the agenda. There is that fear, uh, you know, are we talking about um, you know, reducing the workforce? Are we talking about cuts? Um, uh, you know, and uh, you know, certainly the conversations I have, it's around using our resources, um, you know, uh, in the best way possible uh, in, and effectively. So when you're talking about bots, I mean, bots are programs, you know, that interact automatically with the user. So actually what we're saying is, you know, those frequently asked types of things, actually, you know, you don't need human intervention, which means that actually then you can actually um, uh, sort of divert your resources to the specialist stuff that does require extra time and more in-depth, um, you know, face-to-face -face or uh, phone um, interaction, you know, with the public. Similarly, uh, you know, with artificial intelligence, you know, that is all about actually trying to uh, work out uh, human behavior and use that, you know, uh, you know to, um, uh, to help us um, inform, um, you know, how we're going to, you know, deliver our public um, uh, services. So I think actually, you know, um, you know, I'm reiterating some of the things that have already been said, but I think, you know, the potential here is a fantastic one. I think we should not fear, uh, you know, technology, um, and uh, we should embrace it. And I think if we do that, we'll find that actually our public, um, uh, you know, we're not actually compromising our public service ethos. 
Thank you. Actually, that's it. Really? <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, thank you, Kushal. I mean, that's 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 a great um, segue, really, into the next part of this discussion. By the way, for all of you listening, um, very soon you're going to have a chance to take part directly in this. Um, I'd like you to come up with some really constructively challenging and difficult questions for my panelists. They're going to really en enjoy that. Yeah, thanks, um, Joss. So yeah, uh, uh, I won't. I won't have to answer these, and if you don't ask any really difficult ones, I'm gonna, I've got some up my sleeve for them. But just before we do that, um, I'd like to bring in um, Sonia Halliwell, HR and OD director from Wigan Council. Uh, Sonia, uh, we talked about the barriers generally, um, and Kushal talked about quite a, quite a lot of those in terms of you know making sure this is about people and it's less about uh, technology dominating. And I, I opened this with a with a suggestion that actually uh, we've, we've got to uh, obviously allow our IT colleagues to have an important part, but the IT leadership shouldn't dominate this. It needs to be about leading change and HR people in particular needs to get more directly involved in this and they need to have the, the right and the capability of doing so. So I, I, I wonder what, what we need to do to help address the barriers that HR people are facing or indeed whether or not uh, you know whether, whether we think maybe this isn't an HR role at all maybe there needs to be a completely different profession or a different approach to how we tackle this now you know I, I guess everybody's starting position is that this is something that HR needs to do uh, but if they don't I guess someone else might what's your view about these barriers are you there Sonia Well, I can hear some noise in the background. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming Sonia is either on silent or Sonia, you can't hear me. So one of my other panelists, would you like to pick up this question? So just to just to reiterate the question, um, the barriers that HR people specifically face, whether they're actually the right people to take the lead on people change um, because you know I think we're all saying actually they need to step up to the plate and move away from just being a traditional profession so uh, which of my panelists would like to pick up on that I mean maybe Caroline as you started I could bring you back in at this point yeah I was, I was gonna say I'm happy to take that one I mean I agree I think there's a, an absolute personal responsibility for HR to be involved in this because they do um, uh, hear things in the organization they do see sort of the temperature gauges of, of what's going on and as individuals if we're not um, keeping ourselves up to speed I don't think we've got the right even to be an HR professional because digital skills to me is a fundamental part of being a worker and if you are going to be effective at work you should have these as baseline skills so uh, you know I, I think that there could potentially be um, a, a lead by a transformational person or an, an IT person but HR tends to gauge the organization and tends to have the relationship with um, senior leadership teams to actually bring in some of that challenge um, and bring in some of that um, well why are you trying to remove the training budget type scenario because you need it for X without it being seen that you're trying to protect a, a HR or your own siloed area where we're bigger because because we do think about the wider councils. We're not just thinking of our service when we're trying to challenge the status quo. So for me, as a, as a personal person, I think you should be doing it, but also as a professional, I absolutely think HR should be taking the lead on this skill. Josh, can I yes. come in on that as well? Yes, please uh, do, Kushal. Uh, I think actually um, um, agree, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, with what has just uh, Caroline has just said. I think um, certainly um, uh, um, for me, actually HR very very critical, um, uh, and certainly in Warwickshire, you know, traditionally we're talking about uh, you know a, a number of years ago. Actually, I think there was the assumption that HR, you know, sat in the you know in the rooms and uh, you know uh, you know and actually policy and procedures were then circulated. But what I certainly um, you know endorse is that they need to be equal partners around the table uh, because they do bring a very valuable skill on how um, you know we do transform the, uh, transform the culture in the organisation. You know what you know and uh, you know contribute to the whole um, you know the skills agenda. Um, you know, I spoke about recruitment. How, you know, how do we become more innovative um, in attracting the right people? You know, who can you know do the jobs that we're requiring of our workforce now? 
So I tend to think about um, a number, and you know, we mentioned ICT as well. I think again, uh, you know, traditionally, I think the questions we asked of ICT tended to be all around infrastructure and uh, the widgets and all that kind of stuff. And actually, there was a lack of uh, awareness and understanding on how the end-to-end -end customer journey looked like and what was required uh, in terms of the end product. So for me, ICT are also equal partners when we are looking at you know customer journeys and you know, and and trying to work through um, having um, you know the most slick customer journey that is going to give that satisfaction um, so that you don't have you know uh, you know the wasted calls or the avoidable contacts. Um, um, and I think that is actually, uh, you know, um, uh, I think the organization's responsibility to ensure that those colleagues actually are, uh, you know, on the, you know, around the table on day one, you know, when you are talking, uh, you know, about any change or transformational um, programs. I'd just like to come in as well on a slightly different slant as well, Joss. Yeah, go ahead, Neil. So. HR absolutely needs to lead from the front and there are lots of different ways in which they can do that yeah so first of all they need to work in partnership with the whole organization I think that's just a given these days right um, and uh, then they need to sort of uh, lead and model uh, how digital can work in our organizations so I'd have thought processes such as lever and starter processes they all need to be digitalized yeah um, and the way that HR then uh, asks for performance management uh, to happen across the organization uh, that can have digital at the heart of it um, the fact around the whole culture discussion about how to sort of promote and provide workshops to enable people to get new skills whether it be lunch and learn and things like that HR can take that from the front as well um, so you know like what we need really is our HR professionals to work alongside all of us within the rest of the organization to, to make ourselves sort of uh, digitally culturally enabled I think those are all really good points I, I, I'm going to bring in the audience now uh, if I may uh, please type in your you've got this screen there it's your turn to join the debate you just if you've got that box you should see that box just enter a question I will see the questions and I will pass them on I, I either to the panelists in general or to one in specifically if you want to ask a, a specific one a question um, just while people start typing in some questions I've got one that's come in um, uh, I'm going to push back to you Neil on this one um, I, I my background is largely technology based but it's technology change and I've always worked hand in glove with HR professionals on this um, but I'm going to ask a slightly tricky question and, and that is um, I still see HR professionals in some organizations being really quite reticent about um, all of this, feeling quite protective over, I think as Kushal was describing, the traditional basis on which the profession operates. And I wonder if, you know, we sort of need to acknowledge this or, or whether my experience is just that, you know, this, this is more isolated and uh, in general, the HR profession is, 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 is raising its game and changing what it does or whether there, there really is quite some quite ingrained HR practice that makes it difficult. Neil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, one thing that ju immediately jumps to mind, right? So uh, we heard earlier on about sort of revising policies and things like that and making them more streamlined and things like that. I think actually the way that we go to market to get our new people, right? Um, I don't think that's particularly digitally savvy yeah and it doesn't necessarily entice the right people into our organization um, so uh, whether or not there's some reticence there or some traditional approaches that we can tackle uh, and to, to bring that to life I mean the fact that sometimes you can have to fill in a really lengthy application form even if that is online it's still a very lengthy application form. yes yeah yes it takes forever to to get to the end whereas actually these days i wonder whether or not things like uh the traditional job description and person spec and things like that are a bit outdated and whether or not a one pager which gives these are the sort of 10 things that need to be delivered in the next two years 
would be a better way of getting the right people into the organisation. So I wonder whether or not perhaps we've got some traditionalism at the very start of the process about bringing new people in uh, that, that's a blocker. So what might be helpful is if we can provide some guidance, you know, perhaps with, with PPA, PPMA in particular, in um, how HR professionals could address these sort of points, the sort of things that they should be thinking about in order to move from maybe a traditional basis in it, you know, maybe the culture of their organization and how they can change the culture of their organization, because it's not an easy task. You know, it's actually a lot easier for IT to simply bring in some new tools and technology, much harder for the HR profession to change how the organization looks, feels, thinks, breathes and so on, isn't it? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, with PPMA, I mean, this year is the first time that I've sort of got engaged and there is a lot of forward thinking HR people out there. Yeah. So, uh, however, I think there's more that we can do as or I can do and others that come from a digital background to, to sort of um, to, to help form some of those ideas. I agree. So I've got a, got a question here um, that I'd like to to put to the uh, the panel. Um, Kushal, I'm going to ask you initially on, on this one, if I, if I may, because I think it's something that you touched on and, and I know Neil did as, as well. It's a question about the um, creating a climate and a basis for effective coaching, mentoring and support for digital, digital skills. So uh, we, we know that um, many organisations have are reporting very poor digital skills in frontline staff. So th only 3% of councils, I repeated this one, from earlier on, only 3% of councils are reporting that the digital skills of frontline staff is good, which in a digital age seems to me to be a bit scary, actually. So what should HR professionals be doing to create that culture for coaching and mentoring um, in, in particular to, to, to upgrade uh, those digital skills? Kushal, if I can ask you initially. Yeah, okay. I mean, one, one of the things, um, that actually certainly you know uh, you know we're embarking on is um you know we, we talk about um you know the word digital savvy has been mentioned and um i think there is a bit about defining um you know you know what do we mean by digital savvy in the public sector arena um you know you know and when we talk about competence and skills what are we talking about that are we just talking about you know good keyboard skills or are we talking about being able to um you know undertake um you know a web chat which doesn't um you know um uh, the language is different um you know um you know uh, and uh, you know um the conversations different uh, to you know so i think there is a bit uh, that um you know um i think uh, i would say um that um HR needs to be um, probably more proactive. Um, you know, I, I talked about uh, you know HR getting around the table, but actually, what we need to um, sort of um, have is HR coming. Um, you know, before we've even asked the question to say actually, because we talk about the digital age, and actually that that has been evolving over the over a decade now. And we are talking about digi digital skills now. And um, you know, um, for me. You know, they should be that, uh, you know, that, you know, that word in the future proofing, you know, you know, what do we want our workforce of the future to look like? We here, here, you know, we've got a start of a tent for the organization to think through. What does that mean in terms of, you know, what good looks like in terms of recruitment? So for me, um, rather than actually, you know, reacting, um, you know, um, you know, and, um, you know, it's always, um, you know, um, dangerous to be generic. Um, you know, I, I would like HR to be saying, uh, you know, we talked about Aylesbury and, uh, you know, the prototype of uh, Alexa that they are, um, you know, testing. What, how does that change, uh, you know, our interface with the public when we're talking about people in their homes having conversations? Um, you know, uh, and that kind of stuff. So uh, that's where I'd be going. Uh, you know, with, uh, with you know with HR in terms of the you know uh, you know um, you know looking at what public private sector, look at what other countries are doing, and then saying actually let's have a have that dialogue and here's how we can help you. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a, a question come in now uh, about the customer journey. Um, Caroline, I wonder if you could pick up on this one from Andrew Jacobs online. There's been a lot of talk about customer journey. How have HR worked with their customers and the workforce to co-design co HR processes? 
Um, I think in some aspects they haven't, and I think that's what's sort of coming to light now, that HR has been very focused um, in a number of organisations on reducing staff, streamlining, getting on with it, with and, and actually forgetting the customer as part of that. Um, I think that's changed probably in the last year or so, um, where HR have got some, some time now to think about things rather than just reducing the workforce to actually upskilling the workforce and what we need to do. So, um, for example, when, when we've done things in um, Havering and Newham, we've absolutely engaged because we have two different councils that we're supporting. We've engaged with them to say, what is it you actually want? So we've done um, uh, e-forms and we've actually gone out to staff to say, what is really difficult? What's a pain? What would you like us to reduce? And actually start um, working with them. What's the key things? If we were to do this bit first, how would that make your life easier? And then I think there has been some reticence of, of staff actually admitting when they don't have some of these skills, because where there's been redundancy threats, you are not going to want to say, actually, I can't do this or I can't do that. So I think now again, where we're a little bit more settled, we're hopefully getting staff to recognise that if they come forward and, and acknowledge they do need support, we can upskill them by the time then we need to make significant cuts again, because obviously that, that's not going to go away. So I think there has been some fear factor, and I think in the past HR perhaps haven't because they've just wanted to get on with it because of timescales and, and work pressures. They've not actively engaged the, the customers. But I, I definitely, from people I speak to, I'm hearing a sea change in that, where they realise like you would consult with the unions, actually you need to consult with, with other people too. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It is a good point. And I, I, I mean, it's interesting, there are quite a few questions coming in now. There's, um, mo moving on, if I may, to another one. I've, I've passed this on to you, Neil, but just to read it out for those who are uh, online. Really good point here from uh, Patrick. While only 3% uh, of staff may have uh, good digital skills, they're probably all using a smartphone, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter. So perhaps we don't need to worry about the digital skills of those using their services, we'd be better concentrating our efforts on changing the culture from being paternalistic to collaborative. Um, I think that's an interesting point, Neil, and, and, I, and I wonder you know, whether, whether we should say, look, actually, people do have the digital skills in our organization, but somehow they're not associating them with the work that they have in hand once they walk through the front door of the office. What, what's your view about that? Yeah, we, we, we talked about or in my slide, we, I talked about leadership and absolutely in our organisations at the moment, included uh, Worcestershire, we still have uh, not enough leadership around collaboration and about sharing challenges together to work out how we can solve them. So although we've introduced workshops, uh, sort of design thinking, um, sort of digital culture type collaboration type workshops, we still need to do more. And I think part of it is that people sometimes are very comfortable with what they already know and the ways and practices that they have previously used. So it's an open question really about how we do bring people away from think things, that their own behaviours yet that they have and how do we change those behaviors uh, mm. and there's no easy answer sometimes actually uh, some people will refuse to change and that means that therefore we need to deal with that as an organization and say actually we do need different behaviors and if you don't change your behaviors then you, you, you can't be part of what we need from the future organization so one thing that we've introduced at Worcestershire to help with that is that when we're managing performance, we're not only looking at the actual digital skills or the actual skills of a person, we're also looking at the behaviors of a person. And those two things, the skills and the behaviors, therefore actively become the performance. So I would say we, we need to concentrate our efforts around there. Good point, um, good point. Can I just come in on that one too, Joss, please? Yeah, please do, Caroline. Um, 
Yeah, because I, I, I'm, I'm very much into um, to behaviours and, and recruiting on behaviours and, and um, succession planning on, on behaviours. Because so many times we do have people that, as you say, at home are on Amazon, are buying everything online, don't even think about it. And yet when they're coming into work, there's this barrier around, I've not been trained, so how do you expect me to do this piece of work? Um, and it does come back at the old um, adage of change the people or change the people. There are some people that just absolutely do not want to engage with how the workforce is changing and how businesses are changing. But they have a choice because if they don't make that choice and change or leave, we have to make that choice for them because we cannot carry people that have got those behaviours now in future because digital is the way forward. So you either embrace it or you go and live on an island somewhere. Yeah, I think that's right. But on the other hand, that, that you know, there's an awful lot of change going on. And there's also an argument, Caroline, is there not that we need to nurture and develop our, our, our people repositioning them for the future rather than saying, sort yourself out or move on. I mean, I'm playing that, devil's advocate a little bit uh, here, but yes, no, absolutely. And that is about changing the people or changing the people. You've got to give people the skills. You've got to give them some of those opportunities to learn to change. But if ultimately people make that decision, they're not going to. There has to be a decision made because we haven't invested in some of these skills. You know, we, we've these are the type of things that over um, the periods of time when we've done research through PPMA, it has been very much on delivering reductions, not delivering talent and succession planning. And those things have got to definitely turn around because, you know, we have some very skilled staff that are in the wrong jobs because they've not had the opportunity to do the other jobs that yeah. they would fly in, absolutely fly in. So I totally get your, your point. So I think Gosh. it's a good point. Yes, hello. Is that Kushal? Yes, it is. Um, can I come in just very briefly? I know there's lots of questions. Yes, uh, I've other got, questions sorry, Kush, you need to Kush, just Kushal, very briefly, I think one of, one of the things that as organizations we also need to consider, so it, it's true, you know, out there that we're using a technology um, you know, um, you know, um, you know, to do shopping and all sorts of stuff. Um, but actually, sometimes I think we're putting some barriers in the way of our, um, you know, uh, our colleagues, um, you know, so um, and we need to provide a support. So I think sometimes we're, for example, we're risk averse occasionally um, when we look at social media, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, in, in how we interact with our public and have the chats with them. And some authorities actually, you know, stay away from social media because they foresee problems, uh, you know, uh, you know, that they might have to deal with. And I think actually, if we are true in saying we are embracing technology, then actually some of those policies and procedures that we currently have in place, uh, because maybe we have been risk averse, also need to be challenged. And we also need to ensure that actually, um, you know, we do provide um, the support for our staff. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, if things go wrong, you know, because we, you know, you know, it's not a perfect world, and sometimes things will go wrong. Um, and but we continuously learn, you know, by using, uh, you know, uh, technology. So I think this is where actually we, um, uh, you know, and you know, as organisations, might have been risk averse in, um, you know, uh, with some of our policies and procedures, which then mean that actually staff are not then uh, exposed to using some of the technologies that we use yeah. in our private life. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, I think that's a really good point. And there's another one, Kushal. I've, I've, I've passed the question on to you. I'll come to it in a moment, if I may, because I want to pick up another one. But there's a, a question that Ellen has raised about, you know, what, what do we really mean about digital skills here? What are the descriptors, the parameters that we should be thinking about when we design systems? I, I come, I come back to that, Kushal. Hello, is someone yes, on the line? Yeah, no, okay, Kush, Kushal, if you can come back to that in, in, in a moment. Um, I wanted to pick up on a more technical question. Um, David has, has um, put in a question, which I think is a really good one. It may be a bit technical for the discussion here, but I'll, I'll read the question out. The, the, does the panel agree that new and emerging technologies such as low-code software development isn't being embraced in depth due to this lack of understanding and knowledge about the art of the possible. I'm going to make this a general point because things like low code software development allow people to be able to do their own simple programming. And actually, a lot of us do this through apps on our phone without even thinking about it. But in the workplace, our lack of understanding about some of these simple technologies, the newer technologies that are out there, and indeed, perhaps our IT department 
is continuing to have to maintain and support some old legacy tools is actually holding back some of this cultural change. Uh, Neil, I, I wonder if, if you have a view on that one. Yeah, I mean, we've got a low code digital platform at Worcestershire and we actually had this debate at our wider leadership team yesterday because although we've done absolutely stacks of digital change and digitalizing processes, we've still got a lot more to do. Yeah. And uh, so the sort of challenge out there uh, and one way that we're potentially looking to deal with it is actually to put our developers who use that low code uh, technology into the directorate yeah so that yes. they are actually placed in the directorate seeing what the daily challenges are and the weekly challenges and the monthly challenges and then answering them and pr according to the to the priorities of our organization because some of these things only take a few days to sort out yeah and then you've got that sort of digital uh, process in place so i think by moving the people uh, who know that low code technology into more into the business we we can deliver faster and i think what that will also mean is that we start transferring skills from digital developers to yeah. other people in the actual uh into the actual business and the, the people can then pick up that tool themselves and we won't need digital developers in the same way or the digital developers will be uh, dealing with more complex challenges uh, and the business can then be getting on and doing other more simple uh, digital challenges. I, I, and I think that's absolutely right. But, you know, I, I guess quite a lot of um, HR professionals might find it slightly scary if their role descriptions in future included being proficient in um, low code software development. They probably say that feels more like an IT role. But actually, your point is to strip away the jargon and say, look, we're going to actually be giving you the tools to do some of the things that in the past you'd have to rely on your IT department to do. You know, you can see a future where social workers become IT professionals in as much as one of the main ways of allowing people to stay in their own home, to be connected to family and friends, to continue to, you know, participate in society despite maybe, uh, you know, physical disability is through technology. So it becomes part and parcel of what a, a, you know, a social worker needs to do. And therefore, they will need to develop the skills and understanding and, and you know, uh, in their own role in the same way. HR professionals um, have, have, have a function, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can see HR professionals in future getting hold of low code development tools and delivering solutions with them. Absolutely, I can. And in fact, it's already starting to happen outside the public sector. So if you look at the private sector, they're already starting to use some of these low code tools uh, in order uh, actually in the business to deliver. And I can yeah. see HR yeah. being part of that. So, um, uh, Kushal, can I quickly come back to you? Um, when we're referring to digital skills, says, says Alan, what kinds of parameters and descriptions should be thinking of? I mean, for you, if you could just summarize in a nutshell, what do we mean by digital skills? And isn't it a bit of a moving feast? Because, you know, the skills today will not be the same as tomorrow. Is it, is, should, it should we be defining a journey rather than a specific skill set? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, uh, and apologies if others don't agree, I think sometimes we can complicate uh, this, you know, when we talk about, um, uh, you know, digital skills. I think, you know, if you want developers, uh, you know, and I have a team of developers, then of course coding and whatever, you know, is important. Um, you know, so for me, uh, you know, the work we've been doing over the years, um, you know, the last few years with our HR and other colleagues, is actually um, defining, um, you know, the different roles we require in the organization, and they are different. So uh, in my contact center, you know, uh, we do need people who are, you know, have good, you know, good, um, you know, uh, keyboard skills, but also um, good skills in, 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 in terms of, you know, how they're um, sort of, um, you know, um, having that conversation, you know, uh, you, know um, you know, with a member of the public, be able to go through different screens and, access different information, be it from the website or you know, other using other software. So that's in the, in, the, in, the, in our contact center. When I'm looking at you know, our, our front door staff 
actually the change we are asking them to do, uh, you know, now um, undertake is actually instead of when people come in and say, I want this, you say, okay, I'll do it for you, is actually how are you going to help, um, you know, um, uh, people and communities to find their own solutions? And some of that is actually using technology. So what I'm actually asking of the staff is you need to have awareness of, um, you know, the information we have, where it is accessible, um, be it on the mobile, be it on tablets. And then I want you to be able to coach and mentor, you know, sort of uh, members of the public to using that with confidence, you know. you know, um, So that is a different skill that, you know, we are requiring um, you know, um, you know, off our staff. So it's, it's. I think it, it must have. I think it was Neil who talked about changing that. Uh, um, you know, that relationship that we have with our public from being paternal to actually. You know. Uh, you know, we're going to trust you. Um, you know, um, to be able to deal with your life, but we are giving you some tools, and we will help you to use those tools. So I think actually sometimes being digital savvy. Um, you know, uh, you know, it can scare people because actually people will be thinking, does that mean I need to know the workings of, um, you know, coding and all that kind of stuff? And it's not true. You know, uh, you know, I'm not uh, a techie, but I would, I, you know, I hope I, I do embrace some technology. But that's because it makes my life easier. And we need to explain that to the public that actually, you know, the reason we think you, you need these skills is because actually it will make your life easier. Um, yeah. And uh, the conversation has to change. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's the conversation we are having here with our communities and, uh, you know, with our staff. It's a good, good point. I, I want to bring Caroline in in a, in a moment. I've had a question, another question through I'd like to pick up. But just before we do that, um, Alison uh, Kushal has raised a question about this. The fear and vulnerability staff feel in using new technology and digital training. Um, the, the, the training is required to overcome that, but not just on the kit itself, not just on the technology, but the new process is wrapped around it. So what is the role, Kushal, of HR professionals in supporting service continuity while staff are released to contribute to the change? And I've seen this on several times. You know, you've got a major transformation of program. Um, you can't afford to you know, to, to, to employ lots and lots more staff. Maybe, as we've seen in our surveys, um, there's a, an increasing dependence on external uh, consultants who may well not be passing on the skills. How do we release our staff and support them on change programs, digital change programs? Um, and what's the role of HR in that? That's for me, is it, um, Josh? Is well, if you, if you, a quick, if, yeah. uh, yes, if oh. you, Charles, if you just, because it carries on from what you were saying, just a quick response, and then I'd like to bring in Caroline. That's fine. I think, for me, um, if you are going to see the transformation uh, uh, and change program as separate to other work that you do, then actually you will have that problem of, um, you know, releasing stuff. And certainly what we have actually just embarked on, um, part of the change programs we're doing is that we actually have what we call the enabling board and um, you know in there sit uh, on the table to make decisions and inform the change agenda and these are people who are uh, key um, sort of colleagues in the organization we're not talking about contractors or anything like that um, you know who sit around the table and really the challenge that I you know I happen to chair that board uh, that we are going to be giving the rest of the, um, uh, you know, the organization is, okay, if you've got the adult social care, um, you know, um, um, uh, change program, talk to us about actually, you know, what is the culture change you're looking at? What is the skills you are saying, you know, the social worker of tomorrow is needing? And that actually is embedded as part of the organization uh, rather than actually we now need to backfill um, and um, as part of that, our directors have said, okay, as we move on, how do we really, you know, how do we get capacity? And we have got a transformation fund to do that, so that we're not trying to get everyone to do a million things badly. So if the whole program is part of, um, you know, what I call business as usual, but still transformation, then you have to acknowledge that you will have to invest to save, is, um, you know, our approach in Warwickshire. I think that sounds sensible, Ca Caroline. I'd like to bring you in with a with this with with a broader view that you've picked up through PPMA uh, on this. Uh, you know, I, I worry a little bit that uh, according to our survey, not only do we report in councils that we've got insufficient resources 
to do what we need to do and insufficient skills. But the solution to this is rather than training our own people, according to the survey, over 50% of us are simply increasing our dependence on external consultants. Is, is that the best approach as we go through this sort of transition? No, I don't think it is the best approach. I think it comes back to one of the points I made earlier, where um, HR and people that are here know the organisation. Sometimes you need some of that external um, challenge, definitely to, to look at your internal processes or the way you're doing things. And, you know, um, some of the giving them, they can look wider and see what, what's on the market. But what I don't think you could do is have a team which is part, sort of parachuted in that's going to change the organisation and parachute out again um, because that cultural change will not go with it. So I think it fundamentally has to be a mix of internal and if you require some external um, specialists, you bring them in um, at that point. Otherwise, I think there is a risk in that approach. Yes. I wonder also, there's a question came in from Kevin uh, about innovation, which I thought was, was quite a good one. It sort of relates to this. Kevin mm. was making the point that there's a need to promote innovative stakeholders. He, he mentions um, Theo Blackwell, who we've had involved in some of our programs, um, who, who are leaders, politicians, executives who are promoting innovation. Um, what do we do? to help drive innovation and that sort of performance? And, and how do we grow member champions, political support for this? I think, what, you know, earlier on, uh, I think it was you, Caroline, was mentioning, you know, the importance of ensuring that we've got political backing uh, for, 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 for this sort of work. Caroline. Yeah. Um, yes, definitely. Again, this comes back to a previous comment where um, members may come into meetings with huge, great big agendas rather than, than looking on iPads and how that might be perceived um, if, you, if your members are on perhaps webinars for the, the council meetings, when people see that approach and, and perhaps see it as an old fashioned council. Um, I think we've got some fantastic members that really have taken this, um, this digital journey and, and what can come, what innovation and, and change can come from it. And I, I, I think that is something that, that the, even the Fawcett report that, that came out last week has, has emphasised, is that that diversity in, in um, members. If we've got members that are bringing different ideas and bring, we need to champion them. Um, and I think that, that again is something that um, through publications like the MJ that we can get um, some of these members to say what's gone on in their organisations where they've worked with officers to actually bring about the change. But you know, there, there are some um, members that have been um, members for many, many years and are quite comfortable in staying as they are because it works. Whether that will work in five years time, 10 years time is the question. So we do need to look at, at um, coaching and bringing in some of the, the um, external people that we've got to showcase this can happen just by thinking about things differently. And I think you know, to me that sounds a very pragmatic uh, approach. You know, I, I'm I, I I don't think you can build all the skills in house and and retain them because you may not need them for very long. But there has to be a core capacity that creates that that sort of impetus for change, uh, Caroline, as, as as you describe it. Um, and and it, we can't simply say, well, we'll just buy in what we need to do this rather than do it ourselves because you're just putting off the time at which you have to create those those in-house those in-house skills Yes, and I think some of the things, I mean, we've done it, we've actually um, moved some of our staff. So one of my business strategic business partners has been moved onto a corporate transformational project and then I backfill beyond her. So that then means that she's getting the, the skills, she knows the organisation, she can bring in that challenge, she's freed up to do that specific work and I can backfill it. What, what's, what's the challenge is if this happens um, time and time again where you're not given the opportunity to backfill or get people to, to act up into positions so again they develop um, because there isn't that capacity just sitting around nowadays waiting for, for jobs to come along but I absolutely think there are people internally we need to be giving first opportunity to some of these things for. Yes so there's a uh, I mean, uh, Neil, perhaps I could bring you in on this one. There's a, a comment from um, Alison at Stevenage. Um, they've recently moved change managers and program management to sit alongside the HR team. Seems quite an innovative approach, I think. 
Um, previously, this was aligned to IT. That sort of speaks volumes, doesn't it? And they're now just starting out to undertake a modern HR business partner role. Uh, and Alison's question is, how could we make this uh, most uh, make most of this opportunity? You know, the alignment with HR. Um, in an organization which is seeking to deliver digital customer services plus process technology uh, and skills uh, in the office. Um, Neil. Yeah, it's a really good question. And uh, actually, I really applaud that in terms of what's going on there in terms of getting the change in program managers in the HR, because uh, that's a great place to go and instigate that, that change. I, I think the idea is that I would put in there. One of the things that's really been powerful for us has been around the use of business analysts. So actually those business analysts are often different to perhaps the program and change managers. Yeah. Um, mm. So I, I, I would therefore look and see how I could embed the, uh, the business analysts within that change program and, and HR function uh, because the business analysts are the ones often um, that one, they understand the business because either they've worked there um, or uh, they've got data uh, that they've got uh, to back up uh, their understanding. Um, so by taking those business analysts and, and helping them shape that future organization, uh, that, that would be the technique I, I would propose. I think that's a really in interesting point, and I'm sort of glad we've got on to this subject. Um, we had several comments um, during the um, webinar uh, about uh, HR being a little bit, by its nature, a little bit traditional, quite concerned about protecting people, and therefore, you know, some of this change is, is, is slightly um, culturally different. Um, and I think, Caroline, you, you started by talking about uh, operational versus strategic role of HR and then and the need to move away from a lot of the operational towards strategic functions. And it seems to me, Caroline, if I could put this one to you, uh, building on Neil's point, that if um, if we were designing an HR function for the future, it would look quite different. And as Neil says, and Stevenage um, are already doing, you'd bring together a whole range of newer disciplines into perhaps a different professional type of grouping. And you might not even call it HR, but you would bring in the business analysts that are, that are actually now fundamental to job redesign and, and job structuring. Um, you bring in people who may be looking at organizational structures and governance around digital operating models. Uh, you'd bring in your change and transformation leaders alongside the people who have the, you know, the, the, the more traditional HR our skills. What, what's, your, what's your view about that model for the future? Do you see that actually happening? I do. Um, I see it happening now. Uh, I mean, we work very closely that with the, our two, the two councils that I um, support, we've got the, the, the big transformational journeys going on in those and we work very, very closely. Literally, in, in you know, in one of my councils, we sit next to them. They're in the same, so no, they're not part of the HR department. They absolutely sit next to us so that decisions that are made and are spoken about are clearly evidenced and, and heard by all. So I think there, there has to be a, a, a change journey. I mean, one of the posts that I've actually got in my structure is an HR data analyst. Now, there is lots and lots of statutory stuff we have to do that that role undertakes, but it also looks at other things um, as part of it. And that's somebody that um, come, they, they're a doctor in, in information. They've got an HR background, but actually they, they are very, really, um, digital and uh, data savvy, that they are using that to benefit my department, therefore me benefiting um, both councils. So again, I think fundamental skills we used to have in HR, core skills are changing. Um, and this is where it comes back to that strategic business partner who has to think differently than just looking at um, at, at just a HR. Um, one of the things we're actually looking at through PPMA, funnily enough, and one source is skills that business partners need now. And we are looking at working with uh, CIPD and SIPFA along with a, an, a, a business partner qualification because you do need finance, you do need IT, and you do need HR. If you're going to be a true business partner, you should know all of that because you should then be able to support them on the business. So again, I think a fundamental change on how we see our technical specialisms is going to change fundamentally in the future. I'd just like to add to that point, Joss. Yes, um, please do, Neil. 
a sort of a practical example, what we've just done actually, one of our business analysts that's previously sat within our uh, technology and transformation team has actually just become the talent manager for the organization. That speaks volumes really around the fact that this person who's come from a, a, a sort of a business analyst data type focus is now our talent manager. Yeah, so that's really going to help drive that sort of change in terms of the type of people that we want within our organization and the type of people that we're going to promote in future. It's interesting, isn't it? I think that's a great point. And, and you know, the, just this conversation is this part of this conversation is saying to me that um, there's a massive opportunity here for HR professionals and particularly the HR leaders. Um, to actually become the future leaders of our organizations, given the focus on, on people and business change enabled by process and money and technology and so on. Uh, but if they don't do that, they could become sidelined. So that we're, we're almost at a, a, you know, a watershed for IT professional, uh, for HR professionals here, which says you can actually be the future CEOs of our, uh, you know, of, of, of our organizations, or you can move into a sidewater. The choice is, is yours, which is, Perhaps an interesting point we'll come on to in a moment. Can I bring in um, Natasha, uh, Natasha uh, Vienendahl, who's our um, lead on the, uh, the the program? I think Natasha, you've got a question. Yeah, I actually wanted to first of all pass on an apology for not being able to get Sonia um, online. She's having a few technical problems. She's listening, but she's not being able to speak. So that's um, all right. Hello. I wanted to pass. <laughs> Hello, to Sonia. Pass on a question from her. So um, I'll send Sonia if she could then you know, pass on a question. So she asked, um, how can HR really drive and support leadership to become visible and become active digital leaders? So what what, what is their role in kind of in in um in driving uh, the leadership of the organisation? That's a that's a good point. So so HR professionals helping the leadership team uh, as a as a as a whole. I, I you see I don't see it happening at the moment. I don't see chief executives going to their HR director saying I want to become a digital leader. What do I need to do? Um, let's start with with Caroline, then go on to to Kushal. A um, couple of bits. Actually, I have had examples of uh, some senior leaders, perhaps not in quite that wording, but saying <laughs> they recognise they need um, those kind of skills because they're, they're telling the rest of the organisations what they need to, to do. And they absolutely need to, to know it themselves um, because, you know, you, if people are going to say things like low code development, or you've got to have some idea at least what, what people are talking about. Um, so, yes, I, you know, I think our leadership is absolutely critical in this if we, we cannot expect the organization um, to change and to embrace um, what for some people you know will be seen as as challenging and um, not perhaps something they particularly want to do because the roles that they enjoy doing are, are changing but the leadership team it comes back to those behaviors and those values if they're asking others to do it they absolutely need to lead the way um, on it. I mean, I know um, with SOLIS, the Society of, of Chief Executive and Leaders, um, they, they again are very much looking at leadership qualities and leadership skills. So again, you know that you're going to have your statutory responsibilities, but actually as a leader, how are we going to lead our organisation and, and show some of that? So there is definitely a sort of an appetite across um, a number of um, professional organisations like PPMA and SOLIS to support chief executives and leaders who may not have come up through um, using these type of digital skills but absolutely need to embrace them now if they're going to expect everybody else to follow them. I, I think that's I think that's quite important I mean I you know I work uh, across many organizations and slightly less than it used to be but I, I will I will often hear main boards when if I'm doing a presentation on digital or what they need to do to get to grips with a you know a strategic digital program they say of course we find it a little bit difficult because we are older out of touch we didn't grow up with it or whatever and and, and it, it makes me slightly cross actually because I just think that's a bit of a cop-out uh, I don't think and, and someone said earlier on in the presentation this isn't about age you can be 86 and become pretty digitally mm. literate if you have a need and a want to do it. OK, systems have to be designed appropriately. But, you know, I think good digital design should be intuitive, easy to access and appropriate to use. So I think there is something here for uh, I absolutely agree with you, Caroline, for HR leaders to say, do you know what? This is what it means. This is what you should be doing. And we can help you to do that. Um, Neil, do you have a view on that one? Yeah, I mean, 
uh, as an organization uh, the, the sort of leadership um, uh, I, actually can I pass on that one yeah, uh, uh, Kashal, do you want to pick up on this? We've also had a question come in from uh, Neil, uh, Neil Keeler on, online. Uh, this is not about content. It's more about how L&D isn't keeping pace with the need for constant learning. The rate of learning, complex systems uh, leaving, is leaving traditional L&D behind and resourcing of those services to embrace digital benefits themselves is possibly an issue. Seems to me to be quite insightful, actually. I think that's a good point from, from Neil that, that actually, you know, if we're struggling to simply move from our traditional base of learning and development and, and to embrace all of this at the same time, it, it, you're constantly running to catch up. Um, is, is that the, 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 the problem? Perhaps if I could bring in Caroline again briefly yeah. on that one because of the broader perspective and then Kushal? Yeah, no, I will do. Hi, Neil. I know Neil personally, so I know he um, is very much at the forefront of um, some of this and some of the leadership um, challenges and, and supporting organisations. Um, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, we've really got to get our HR, L&D, OD, whatever we want to call them, upskilled as well. Because, you know, we, we've reduced training budgets within our own teams. We've asked people to just get on with it, but have not skilled up. So how are L&D, again, how are they supposed to know what's out there if they're not out networking, if they're not out doing these kind of webinars to actually see so they can then go back into their organisations and challenge and say, well, why are we not doing something on X? Why are we still just doing recruitment training? Actually, we don't want to be doing recruitment training. We want to be looking at X. Those kind of things, if, if you're not keeping up to speed with what's out there, you're not then as a professional able to deliver on that in-house. And I think it's fundamental. You know, Neil, Neil runs a service that, that's self-funded. They go out, so they, you, you have to provide what people want. And sometimes you have to tell them what they want because they don't know, because you don't know what you don't know. So I absolutely think it's critical that our L&D function doesn't remain as a typical L&D function. Yeah. Uh, Kushal, do you have a view on that one? Yeah, I mean, um, it just so happened that before joining the webinar, you know, we, you know, I was in in our, in our customer and transformation board this morning, and certainly I have to say in Warwickshire, um, you know, I, you know, I do feel um, and uh, you know uh, supported on, on on all, you know, this particular agenda. And certainly um, in terms of the various leadership teams, you know, we have got the HR business partners sitting um, around the table, uh, you know, and they have, uh, you know, the authority to challenge, uh, you know, be it heads of service or directors. Um, I think for me, um, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, I, I said earlier is that if you want your managing directors or your leadership team, heads of service, service managers, um, you know, to believe um, in, in what we are saying, then actually you also um, have to make it real. Um, you know, uh, you, you know, why does it matter? What does it, what does, you know, what does it look like? Uh, because if you're just saying actually you need to embrace digital without translating what that means for them and for the customers, uh, you know, that they're also responsible for, then you're going to actually struggle to have them as your advocates. Similarly with elected members we were just talking about earlier, you know, we, you know, we did a very, very simple thing, you know, as part of their induction, you know, when we had new members, um, you know, uh, join recently. And it was actually as part of the induction, we took, you know, they all get tablets, you know, and, uh, you know, um, during the induction, we just showed them, you know, what the public was complaining about or reporting. And we took them to the reported, um, you know, sort of pages and said, now when you get constituents, can you help us in, 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 in passing the message on, show them you know how the live stuff works here. You all, you, all you need to do is press a few buttons. It'll tell you, you know, the status of potholes and all that kind of stuff. That made it real, you know, kind of stuff. So now they are actually passing that message out because they're they're just as much our advocates and probably very important advocates, to, um, you know, for us. So I think when we talk about leadership, you know, actually, uh, um, there is the big. It's not just the top, you know, uh, you know, ten in the organisation. We are talking leadership throughout the organisation, and how, um, you know, we are using them as advocates. But we have to make this real, you know. You know, how does it actually change the way either the, um, uh, you know, um, staff or the public, um, you know, um, deliver their services? Yes. 
So I wonder, I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of into our, our, our last part of this session. Uh, and, and, you know, I'd be really interested to know generally from, from those who are on this webinar whether they think HR are currently capable of keeping pace with and eventually driving digital change. Do send a, a comment in um, if you've got a view uh, on that. Um, and uh, you know, this is interesting. There's quite a quite a few agreeing with uh, Neil's point about uh, L and D in 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 particular. Um, so I want to pick up on one um, raised earlier by Kevin. A question earlier: Organizational culture is the biggest issue we face. New staff uh, are already skilled in many ways. Uh, we heard about you know the Facebook and so on. Technology will deliver if it's specified and delivered correctly, but the organizational design, design piece um, is, is, is lacking. Um, what's your view about that? The organizational design piece is, is, is lacking, and I, and I think, um, Neil, I'm going to ask you if you could pick up on this. It feels to me as though, you know, behind this is something about trying to make IT, new technology, and digital solutions fit with um, traditional ways of working. Yeah, so, I mean, on, on the org design, um, we still traditionally, and I'm including our organisation, Worcestershire, in this, we still traditionally sit within our d departments, yeah? So that, that sort of embeds the culture itself, yeah? So w one thing that we're starting to do is work out, actually, how we can combine teams uh, to work together uh, so that we can actually change that culture uh, because that actually allows a lot more joined up thinking uh, about how we can tackle problems. I'd just like to dive then into something like data, for example, as an example, uh, because in, in our organization at the moment, we don't actually understand enough about the way that we use data and the way that we actually use, the first of all, how we capture data and how we then use that data for insight, and then how we use that data for effective decision-making. So that, to me, is something that we can solve together by changing our organizational culture, because there are pockets of good practice across our organization, and I expect many organizations. However, if we can then uh, change the culture, we can get those pockets of good practice and sort of take it across the organization. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Car Caroline Cashel, do you have views on that one? Um, I mean, I, I agree. I think we've, uh, we've we've got staff that are fundamentally sort of skilled in a number of areas. So I, I've always said a, a, an example I've used is um, an HR person could actually go and work in housing benefits or a housing benefits person could work in HR because they're in, some of these are investigatory skills. They're skills that you wouldn't naturally say somebody's got. So I think we've been quite sort of um, narrow minded in the past about what we can use and the data issue, I, I, I fundamentally agree. We've, you know, we we know that we've got um, data, that it may be in my area, but actually it might be really relevant for street cleansing, for example. But I don't think, oh, I wonder if street cleansing need to know that. So I think we've got to get people to think about the data is council-wide data, it's not departmental, and how can it be used for other things? Yeah, and there was a question, uh, and it's interesting, Kushal, just before I bring you in here, there was interesting, there was a question about uh, data and information. You know, I see, I see local authorities in particular moving from being very process driven to being primarily information driven. By that, I mean, it's less about who and how things are done, you want them done well, but actually it's about information. Who needs help? When do they need help? What's the best way of doing it? What services should we do? What's our performance? And a lot of this is data data driven so I think that sort of that sort of fits fits really well sorry Kushal I cut across you I think you were going to come in there no no um, just echoing actually what Caroline was saying I think uh, you know when you know when you do undertake skills audit um, in any organization you will begin to find actually you know like we talk about the generic skills about you know the customer service skills and there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, be challenging organizations you know we because we do um, you know, fit people into their JDs and person specs, and actually that can actually sometimes stop people blossoming 
um, you know, a, a, in areas that they would be really good at. And I think we need to, again, look at our policies and procedures so that we can actually uh, attract the right talent and also grow our own talent within the organization. Um, because actually when we were talking again about a decade ago, you know, some of those skills weren't required. They are now. And we're, I'm finding that I'm working with colleagues who actually, um, you know, uh, uh, love technology and want to be given a chance to play with it, you know, to delve into it. So um, I think there is a bit about, uh, you know, how we are managing our talent um, and also how we're attracting the right talent, um, you know, um, you know, to deliver, the, you know, our, our public services. I think the other thing also, you know, um, uh, you know, with Neil talking about, you know, how we use our intelligence, um, spot on, you know, uh, actually we are so data rich in public sector, uh, you know, we collect so much. But it's actually targeting the data that is necessary, um, you know, uh, that is going to inform our um, customer journeys. You know, we were talking about, you know, artificial intelligence earlier. It's actually that intelligence does begin to tell us a story about how um, our public are behaving and how we can then use that. Um, yeah, you know, to still deliver, you know, what I call excellent, um, you know, customer services. Uh, Neil, I'm going to bring you in on on, on a point that that's struck me as Cushell was describing that particular point, uh, and and it ties in a little bit with a with a bit about recruitment. But I see a lot of um, let's say younger people, you know, leaving university, and they're looking for organisations that are digitally equipped. They don't want to work in some out of date traditional organization where they feel held back because they're not able to exploit the potential of technology that they've used at college, they use in their private lives. And they are selecting organizations now based on their digital maturity, appetite for, for digital for digital change. And uh, you know, I wonder whether we're doing enough, not just to retrain our existing staff, but to say, do you know what, this is this is the world now and we're going to be recruiting people who have got these skills and we need to keep pace with their expectations as well as the expectations of the public. Um, Neil, could, could I ask you for your views on that? We've been recruiting graduates over the last couple of years and what we've actually found is they've brought a new mindset, they've brought new skills. You're right, they absolutely want to use digital. So going back to the data, uh, outside my teams in other teams, like the commercial team and things like that, uh, you know, they've come in and they're not only digital savvy, they're also data savvy. So if you look at the big organizations that have been successful in the last few years, whether it be Google, Facebook and whatnot, they're all data driven. Uh, yeah. And these people want to sort of, uh, they're really interested in that. They, they ask questions about, oh, why is that organization uh, uh, successful? And what do they know and what type of skills do they actually uh, deploy and things like that? So actually those people have come in and they're actually helping to change our culture itself because they're then working as, alongside perhaps uh, other colleagues and saying, oh, have you thought about this? Why do you do it in that way? Why are we capturing that data? How, how are you gonna use that data when you capture, when we do capture it, yeah? What insight is that gonna give and things like that? So um, you're right, we therefore need to attract those people into our organization uh, because that's gonna help drive that sort of cultural change. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to put our, our stall out and say, well, you know, we want those sort of people. And actually, if you do come into our organization, we're not gonna stifle you. We're actually gonna give you the breathing space and the ability to actually go and uh, deliver that change for us. Good point. Um, Neil, thank you for that. We're, we're moving towards a close now. I, if I could just ask each of our panelists to give a quick five to ten second single point. What's your single point that you would you would you would take away from the discussion this morning? I'm going to give you mine, and that is digital is a real opportunity for our organisations and is going to depend massively on HR stepping up to the plate. Sonia. Oh, Sonia's not there, is she still? Uh, perhaps um, Natasha, can you ask Sonia if she's got a comment? Caroline. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think HR have got to come up to the plate, but I think they've got to be allowed to. So definitely in smaller organisations where they're lower down the rankings per se, they've got to be given the chance to come round the table. Yeah, great point. Neil? 
I would say HR can be the leaders of the future with the sort of skills they've got around changing organisations, uh, the culture and things like that, that they've got an absolute opportunity to be the next CEO, to use your words, uh, and uh, they need to grab that opportunity. Great point. Um, Kushal? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, as has already been said, uh, a fantastic, exciting opportunity for colleagues in HR. Uh, embrace it because you can and you can deliver. Great. Um, so I'm going to say thank you to all my panelists. You've, you've added, I think, some real insight to this topic. Um, Thank you very much for, for joining us this morning. I'd like to thank everybody who's coming up. I'm sorry we haven't answered all of your questions. I've tried to make sure we've covered as many uh, as we could. And there was a, you know, a late one came through from Kevin. If we were designing a local authority from scratch, we'd do it differently. Really good point, actually. But we are where, where we are. So my thanks to you. I want to say thank you very much um, to Natasha and EduServe for, for putting this uh, in place. Uh, that We will be circulating, and you will have available both the video and the slides from this should you want to follow up later on. And I do hope that everyone will be able to join us for some of our, our future uh, webinars on this topic, because we'll be certainly publishing some more information and some more, more research, uh, as well as on other areas tackled by the EduServe Executive Briefing Program. So thank you all very much indeed.